the largest and hidden expense of your law firm and how to tame it with Boris Mushayev, episode 75. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Profit with Law. I am your host, Moshe Amsel, and we are right in the thick of this uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, people social distancing, working from home. This is going to be a little bit of a break for you in the uh, COVID series that we're running. So we're uh, just doing a regular interview here. However, uh, this pandemic has already been going on when this interview was recorded. And um, there is a section at the end specifically dealing with helping you find cash to infuse in your practice if that's an issue for you. So I definitely encourage you to stick around to the end and listen uh, to that piece if it's, uh, if it's appropriate for you. Uh, also, uh, as we're closing out the show, uh, Boris and I are talking about how he is doing an information session specifically on um, improving your cash situation. And he gives a date and time for his webinar that he's going to be doing. And then subsequently to that, I, I tell everybody that he's going to be a panelist on our Managing a Cash Crunch uh, section of the COVID live stream series. And turns out that's the same exact date and time for both of those. So uh, just to avoid any confusion, Boris has moved his webinar. The Managing a Cash Crunch COVID live stream is indeed on March 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it will also be uh, repurposed, replayed here on the podcast if you can't make it there live. Uh, but if that's something that is an issue for you, definitely show up uh, because uh, we can then answer your questions live, bring you on, uh, allow you to interact with the panelists if this is something that you want to talk about. Uh, so that being said, uh, let me introduce you to Boris Mushayev, who's a CPA and He's doing some interesting work. Uh, he, he specializes in tax planning for attorneys and law firms. They use proven tax strategies to save their clients tens of thousands of dollars on taxes every year when implemented correctly. They personalize each and every strategy to ensure that their client's family and business situation is thoroughly examined to maximize tax savings. And in their firm, they have one goal and one goal only their commitment to doing everything in their power to help their clients to legally reduce taxes and take home more of their hard-earned money. This has been a topic that has been near and dear and passionate to my heart, uh, and I have been in, in talks with, with Boris about uh, creating an information product that would be an ongoing tutorial and, and, uh, and help business owners, uh, specifically law firm owners, with understanding everything that's available to you in in the tax realm and there's a lot um, so th the, and I even ask him in this interview why our tax preparers are not doing this for us so it's uh, it's a great interview great conversation I really like Boris is very down to earth makes it clear and understandable uh, so I look forward to sharing this with you I'm just gonna ask that if you are a, a listener of the show and you subscribe to the show, we would love it if you would take a moment and do a rating and review for us on the show. Uh, just go into your podcast player, click the button to rate and review the show, and just put in um, hopefully some kind words but uh, and hopefully five stars, but rate it honestly and share that with the world. Because when people come and check out the podcast and question whether they should listen to it, uh, sometimes they're going by that information in the ratings and reviews. And your rating and review can make a difference of somebody hearing what they need to hear and taking action that they need to take. Uh, so 
you have a lot of power in your in in what you do as far as doing that rating and review. And I get it. I we're all busy, and you're probably driving or running or doing something while you're listening to me in your ears. And I I'm you know I'm in the same boat. I'm uh, guilty as charged. I you know I, I'm a I'm a poor person when it comes to rating and reviews. I always rely on somebody else to do it. But uh, if everybody thinks that way, then nobody does it. And you know I. I can tell you that we don't have a lot of ratings and reviews, and that's why I'm, I'm asking for your help. Uh, so if you can just take a moment and do that, that would be amazingly helpful to me and to uh, my mission of getting my word out there, this amazing content to other law firm owners. So that's all I've got for you. Here we go. I'm going to introduce uh, 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 this uh, episode here, this interview with Boris. Enjoy it. Take care. Uh, Boris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Really exciting. It's my pleasure, and I and I do appreciate you making the time to be here, especially since we are recording this during tax season. Although we did kind of just get a little bit of an extension uh, yes. with you know with everything that's going on with the COVID pandemic, they extended filings to mid July for personal tax returns and um, and corporations, but some states may not have followed suit yet. So. We'll see, we'll see where all of that goes. So before we jump into any technical details or discussions, just share with us your journey, how you uh, came about to serving law firm owners, how you came about being a, to being, being a tax accountant. Uh, just tell us a little bit of your backstory uh, without using the whole hour to give us that. <laughs> give us yeah, that of story. course. So, uh, uh, so it all started in the kindergarten. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> So it all started, uh, so I graduated uh, Baruch College in 2010, and I, I went into accounting, and right after I graduated, I really got sucked into the world of traditional accounting, and I, I knew I always wanted to do taxes, but I had no idea what the tax season would look like. And um, I got my CPA, I was working um, in, a, uh, in a traditional accounting firm, we were really doing, I was doing my last count, was almost 500 returns during tax season, just grinding through tax season day and night and just getting those returns out. I was really burned out and I knew that there's something better. And uh, I was really providing no value to my clients just because we're trying to get the returns out the door. So I decided to venture out on my own uh, in 2017 and start my own firm, but uh, not a traditional accounting firm, but really a strategic tax planning is where we don't do 500, where I don't do 500 returns in three and a half months. And I really provide quality service and do proactive tax planning. And as far as why did I end up working with attorneys, you know, somebody asked me that and it got me thinking for a second. And uh, I think it all has to do with John, uh, John Grisham. <laughs> okay. uh, back, in, back in high school and in my college years, I remember reading his books about attorneys. It was so fat. I was so fascinated and interested about this whole law firm, the corporate uh, law practice, but you know, there's no way I was going to end up in a, in a, in a legal, legal industry. So when I graduated accounting, went into tax planning, I needed to pick a niche uh, just because I want to be laser fo focused in a, in a particular area where I can really de deliver value and that's how I ended up choosing attorneys. And um, ever since it's been a great ride. At first it was a little bit hard, I have to, I have to admit, uh, attorneys are very stubborn, at least with my experience, right? But then I, I've come to, to learn them even more and then you know, kind of navigate through it. And I, I think I've developed a great relationship with every attorney that I work with. And we give them a strategic tax planning before the year uh, is actually over to be able to save money on taxes. So that's really my backstory. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, I, I like that your, you know, how you chose attorneys, just it just happened to be that way, right? You have to focus somewhere and uh, and this is the niche that you ended up in. But it's been a learning experience and, and you've come to learn what, their pain points are, what their hot buttons are, and, and how to communicate with them, which is really important with any, you know, target market that you're surveying. But I'm sure that the, you know, that's, that's helping you greatly with figuring out how to address their concerns. I want to dive into, you know, into what you actually do. And uh, I think the first place to start is to really help our audience understand what is the extent of their tax expense. I, I think that if we really put that into perspective, I mean, I believe that tax is your number one overhead more than payroll and more than uh, than rent. 
and um, I'd like to I'd like you to, to to navigate through that and share with our audience and help them understand why that's the case and and how big is is this really so that they can understand why these strategies are so important. Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting you say that, right? Because the most of the businesses, especially attorneys, they're a pass through entity. So when you're a pass through entity, everything gets passed through to your personal return, and that's where you pay taxes. So that you pay taxes from your personal uh, funds of your personal bank account. So every time we're an attorney or really a business owner that is a self uh, a pass through entity, when they analyze their financial statements, they don't see a tax expense on it. So it, it never comes to click. This is my biggest expense on the on the profit and loss because this is paid from your personal account because it's a pass through entity. But in reality, on average, you can safely say that a successful business owner or an attorney, uh, in this case, is paying you know, about 45% uh, on taxes. Now, how do we calculate that? And you might say, well, Boris, you know, the highest bracket is 37 in the federal. How is it that somebody could end up paying 45, even 50%? Well, think about it. There's a federal income tax, which is the highest is 37, plus we've got the state tax, plus we've got city, depending where you are. In New York, we get crushed here. In California, you get crushed, right? On top of that, if you're taking out a salary, you have to pay Social Security and Medicare tax, and that's a self-employment, another 15%. So even though you're in 30% bracket, plus the 15%, plus the state, it really adds up. So it becomes a huge expense. And a lot of business owners don't see it as a huge expense. They know it's a big expense, but it never comes to, like you said, you know, comparing it to my payroll cost that I pay my employees because it's never on a profit and loss statement. Right. So Imagine... they never really visualize it. They never really see it. Yeah. Imagine if your rent or if your payroll was 50% of your of your profit you know and it, it put that into perspective i mean i guess if you have a large enough firm and enough employees eventually your payroll would probably dwarf your tax bill uh but it, it's it's an astronomical number i mean you think about it you take if you if, if you profit um a hundred thousand dollars you only get to keep 50. if you profit Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You only get to keep one hundred and twenty-five. Uh, you know that's 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 crazy. So now I can begin to understand why getting to some tax strategies of how to limit that uh, would be beneficial. Now, if somebody takes full advantage of every strategy available to them, and obviously every single case is different, so you can't give a blanket number here. But right. what kind of decrease in the percentage? Of uh, that they're paying out of their total income in taxes, can they potentially see, you know, happen if you know if if some of these strategies really work out for them? Yeah, uh, good question. So I never really focus on the percentage, right? Um, and I haven't been asked this before, and I never really measure the percentage when I do savings from my clients. But I can tell you right now that you, if you are proactively using tax strategies and being really proactive about it and not wait until the year is over to do something about it, you can save at least $10,000. And we're talking about small firm owner, small business owner. The bigger you get, the more you're safe, right? So, you know, when we take on clients, for example, uh, on a first call, we're going to be are able to tell them what their estimated tax savings are. And by the time we actually deliver them the tax plan, it's always almost double than that because there's always a lot more things to discover. So, I've seen uh, in our firm, I would say about 85% of clients that we deliver a tax plan to with the strategies to use to reduce their taxes is at least $20,000 in tax savings. Again, hard to measure that in number uh, because like I said, uh, it's not that I don't have it. It's probably in the number of percentages is there. We never measured it that way. We always focus right. on how much can we save you in terms of a number rather than a percentage. Right. And, and I, I know that, that a lot of these strategies are going to save you a certain amount of money and it's not a percentage because that's the most that you could save with that strategy. So, uh, but still, I mean, an extra $10,000, an extra $20,000 in your pocket, uh, that's huge. Yeah. So uh, why don't you give us like, what's the, the, the number one uh, strategy that practically everybody you talk to ends up, uh, you know, making sense to implement and that they're, you know, they're missing out on right now. Yeah, so we can definitely cover a couple of uh, basic and most common that I've seen with attorneys and one of the biggest ones, right? And the first thing is that this is like across the board for all the attorneys that I work with is the salary. Most of the attorneys, about 80% attorneys that I work with, they are already set up as a pass-through entity. They already have an S corporation for themselves. Unfortunately, they don't have any guidance of what their salary should be. 
And in most cases, you know, a profitable attorney, a good attorney, uh, is taking out two to three to four hundred thousand dollars in salary, right? Because whatever money is left over in the business, after leaving some for the you know continuous investment and marketing, they take out high salary. But in reality, your salary may not be that high. You should not pay yourself such a high salary. So you really, if you follow the IRS guidelines and we help the clients follow the IRS guidelines is to pay yourself a reasonable compensation, right? So something that does make sense for somebody in your field, in your geographical area, based on your demographics and the type of work that you do. A lot of attorneys that are watching this podcast, they can agree if they're a firm owner, they're wearing a lot of hats in the business, right? At 20% of the time, they're doing some ad admin work. 10% of the time, they could be doing some paralegal. About 30% of the time, they could be marketing for their own firm, right? That leaves them with about 40% of the time to actually do legal work, right? Because, you know, as business owner uh, expands his practice or an attorney owner expands his practice, he's got others to do the work for him and his job is to do the marketing. So your job, you as a marketer and an admin and some paralegal is that the same salary as if you were receiving when you were an if you would be an attorney? Obviously, the answer is no. So when you break down attorney's salary from four hundred thousand dollars, it could go down as low as a hundred thousand dollars. You could be saving tremendous amount of money on self-employment taxes on the three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay, yeah. so that's one of the that's one of the first strategies I would say the biggest one. The other one is the other 20% of attorneys that I, that I come across with is they either sole proprietors or single member LLCs and they never really consider the impact of what it would be if they would incorporate, become a different entity for themselves, right? What that would look like because right now they're paying self-employment tax on their entire net income rather than having a salary. Mm -hmm. So those two things in terms of a salary and entity structure. The third biggest thing that I would say is uh, when they have employees, they, they have incorrectly set up a retirement account for themselves, for the business. Just recently, we signed up an attorney uh, to work with us and do a tax plan. Because he had no guidance, he, had, he has employee, one employee, and because he has incorrectly set up a retirement account, he was forced to pay for his employee's retirement account $10,000 per year. So that, so, so, so that only he can put away 40,000 into his own retirement account. So after I calculated, I'm like, you're saving about $10,000 on taxes by putting 40% for yourself. And then you're taking those savings and putting it into your employees. I'm like, is that the benefit that you're providing? Or are you like kind of forced to do that? And he says, I'm forced to do that. So really restructuring the retirement account when you have employees. And I know we said one or two things. Another fourth thing, which I think is super important, is the attorney owners that pay for their own health insurance from the business normally do not deduct it as a business expense because they paid personally out of pocket. And they say, well, um, I cannot pay it from the business because then I will be liable to pay for all of my employees. So I don't want to kind of cross that bridge. I'll just pay it personally. Mm -hmm. Well, th that is wrong. You can still pay for the insurance, funnel it through W2, save additional FICA taxes, take that additional expense and save a lot more money on taxes. Okay. So really just navigating through these things. And these are, you know, you would think, well, these are common sense, basic stuff. That's true. But then when the time comes to file your taxes, there's nothing, nothing that you can do to fix last, what, what the year, you know, to fix something after the year was over. So these are one of the basic things that we put together in the tax plan. And on top, of course, there's a lot more advanced stuff. You know, if the client is making 800,000, a million dollars, or a million five, net profit there's a lot more that has to do with investments and so forth they get really help them save money on taxes now and in the future yeah absolutely and what what strikes me is i'm sure that listeners are thinking well i have i have a really good tax preparer so why is my tax preparer not telling me this can you talk a bit a little bit about why is is this something that so many so many people are doing incorrectly when they come to you sure that they're not preparing their own taxes so what's going on with their cpa or their tax preparer good question so i was one of those cpas right is that when i used to see my clients once a year and it's just that right now the tax deadline is extended to july 15th it's like a bad good news and bad news uh but it, it, you have to think about it. your accountant and preparer has three and a half months to do tax returns. And that is their bread and, uh, you know, what, what's the word? Uh, uh, bread and butter. Bread and butter, right? That's their bread and butter. Three and a half months to do as many returns as possible to put the numbers in the right boxes, to be in compliance with the IRS and make sure your tax returns are filed. After the tax season is over, most likely your accountant doesn't call you and you don't call your accountant because you don't know what to call him about, 
right? And I count him as a quality because his job is done. He filed your taxes. When you come to him next year, and it, I, I've said this phrase before, I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm going to say what I used to say and what other accountants say as well. It's like, well, you made too much money. It's a good problem to have, right? It's like, unfortunately, that's the answer that I used to give before I became a strategic tax planner. And that's the answer that a lot of people give. Well, you made a lot of money. That, that's a good problem to have, right? Year is over. There's nothing much you can do, but be happy to pay taxes. Be happy right. that you're, you know, be grateful that you're on the side of somebody who's paying taxes, right? So, and then we kind of like call it a day and send the client on the way. We charge our fee, file the taxes, done deal. Everything is filed properly. The number's in the right boxes. And that's it. The IRS doesn't call my client. I'm happy, right? But in reality is that is, you know, that stuff is missed out. And clients are on their own during the year. You know, if they set up a company, they need to do payroll. They call ADP or paychecks set up payroll and no guidance put themselves in payroll. They need health insurance. They call ADP and paychecks and get an expensive group health plan without knowing there are things that the laws in place for businesses like yourself, where you have few employees that you can reimburse your employees individually uh, by putting together uh, some sort of documents. And uh, we can talk about that, I guess, on another podcast maybe. But basically, you don't have to have group plan. You, you can do this and you can do that. You can lower your salary. You can be this entity type. Right? Nobody talks to them about that. And they assume. And clients turn to Google. And clients turn to paychecks or ADP kind of to set up their payroll and all that stuff. And, and the accountant is just waiting for you to come back next year to do your taxes. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's a breath of fresh air when you're engaged with your accountant throughout the year and your accountant has a vested interest in what's going on in your business and taking act an active role in decreasing that tax strategy. Um, so let me ask you this. what what? Let's talk about retirement for a second. So I, I know that there's um, there are definitely ways that a, a, a firm owner can protect uh, a significant amount of their income uh, from taxes by focusing on retirement. Uh, what are some of those options and, and, and what are the, the pros and cons of, of some of them and why, why would somebody consider one over the other? I'm sorry, repeat your question. Uh, consider uh, uh, the different options for retirement plans that they can have in place in their business. Oh yeah, right, Good, great question. So, <clears throat> so when you are starting off as a business owner, it's just you, right? Um, and in most cases, I've seen attorneys do very well for themselves with $200,000 in net profit with almost no employees or some part-time employees. As a matter of fact, we have an attorney that does almost $300,000 uh, $300, with just one part-time employee, right? So when you have a part-time employee or you, you are on your own, there's different types of retirement accounts that you can set up. One of them is being the SEP retirement account, which everybody heard of it, right? The SEP IRA, which is, hey, you take 25% of your net earnings if you're a self-employed individual or 25% of your salary and you put into SEP. The problem with SEP is when you have an employee that qualifies, you have to put away 25% for your employee just as well as you're putting away for yourself. So you cannot discriminate. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some rules in place where the employee has to work with a certain amount of years and so forth. But then, you know, very quickly, your, your firm is, you know, uh, rapidly growing. And by the time, like we had a case with our client, by the time he, he was able to figure out what's going on, the year was over and he had to put away $10,000 into the SEP account for his employee. Okay. The second one is that you, you, the second one of a retirement account is a solo 401k, where again, you're a single owner. Okay. You're allowed to put away up to $19,000, that uh, was a 2019 number, uh, up to $19,000 defer your own income, excuse me, your own salary, plus the 25% of the business. So you can really put away up to $56,000, which is much better than the set because it gives you more flexibility. But again, you hit the, the wall if you've got employees, then you cannot discriminate and you have to put away for them as much as you're putting away for yourself. Right. And with the 401k, uh, that $19,000 is coming out of your reasonable compensation, right? So you're decreasing your self-employment taxes on that as well? No, unfortunately not. It does come out from your reasonable compensation, but it's still subject to self-employment tax. Got it. It's just okay. not subject to the federal income taxes. Okay. Okay. But so, so we've got solo 401k, which is a great option for a lot of business owners who are solo or part-time employees. I love that option. Then when, then when you have employees, you can turn your solo 401k into a regular 401k, which is not a solo anymore because you're not a solo practitioner, right? So what happens is that you have employees, but then you have to make sure, and this is the biggest problem when the uh, you know, business owners make, is that you, you better talk to your financial advisor and you say, hey, I've got employees, they qualify, make sure I have something that's called in the plan safe harbor. That means I will match 3% to my employee no matter what, done deal. 3% to myself, 3% to my employee. 
but you as a business owner can still put away in $19,500 plus the 3%, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a great advantage that you have. So as you start building out your practice, you start having these employees, you can still take advantage of it, put away a lot more money into the retirement account. It will still make tax, you know, make sense in terms of tax benefit, even if you're paying your employees. Everybody's situation is different. It also depends a lot on the age, right? And for those of you that are listening, if you are in your 50s or late 40s, right, or early 50s or even mid 50s, and you've got employees who are 10 years or younger than you, you can actually uh, implement what's called a profit sharing in your 401k, even though you, you have to put away a little bit more for your employees, but you'll be able to put away a lot more for yourself. Really, all of this is part of the tax planning strategies, not something that can be done at the end of the year. It all has to be done. Hey, what can I do right now? Right now is month of March. Are we talking to our financial advisor? Is the financial advisor giving us numbers? Is that, are these numbers going to my account and he's calculating what the tax benefit will be? Does it make sense for me? Do I need to use profit sharing? Because the great thing about profit sharing is that it, it, you could, it could be used one year, it doesn't have to be used second year, right? So these are all the things that goes into the planning. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that question is, is how e easy or difficult is it to change from plan to plan? Because uh, it sounds like this is an evolving situation. So th does the firm owner need to uh, be able to predict the future of their firm in order to, to make the right decision here? Or is this something that you can every year revisit? The profit sharing you can revisit every year. Uh, but the 401k aspect of it, whereas you have a 3% or 4% or 5% match, that kind of stays until you change it next year. I believe you may change the terms. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. We don't handle investments, but from, from my experience, by helping clients do, uh, take advantage of this, this is what we have seen. Okay, and, and what is a defined benefit plan and how does that compare to the 401k and the SEP? Good question. You, you come prepared today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so defined benefit plan is also known as uh, that it could have a cash balance plan, right? So what that means is that you can put away a lot more money into your retirement account. Even like, you know, there's the, the, you you're not you don't have to comply with the fifty six thousand or fifty seven thousand dollar limit like we are in the new year. It can be you know depending on your age and your circumstances and your income, uh, you can put away like one hundred or one hundred fifty thousand, even two hundred thousand dollars, even three hundred thousand dollars, right? Depending how much money you're making, and that's where reasonable compensation comes comes in place. Sometimes lower salary might not cut it when you have to put away into defined benefit plan. So if your salary should be 80,000, but in order for you to take advantage of defined benefit plan, you have to increase your salary to 200,000, is the tax implication makes sense for it or not, right? So that's the first thing you have to calculate. The second thing you have to think about is that when you have defined benefit plan, do you have employees? If you have employees, you could really get screwed because you know, you're putting away a lot of money for yourself. You can't discriminate against your employees. You have to put away something for them as well. But I've seen attorneys who don't have employees and take advantage of the fine benefit plan. Great strategy, but some attorneys that uh, I speak to, they confess to me, Boris, only if I knew that after setting up a defined benefit plan, I have to be tied down to it because it's very hard to get rid of the fine benefit plan. And the cost of having a defined benefit plan is $5,000 a year, right? Is it a great strategy? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. You can, you, if you're in a 37% bracket, putting the way 100,000 is saving you 37,000 at least on the federal taxes. But is it a strategy that works for everyone? The answer is no. Again, careful planning, careful analysis of your current situation, future projections, future goals. Where are we going? When do you want to retire? What are, you know, you, you're going to have somebody young who has these great ambitions and wants to open up other businesses and so forth. All of that has to play into this effect. Yeah, it's beginning to be ob become obvious why you're needed in this in this conversation uh, for somebody to start trying to do all these calculations on their own and try to navigate this and figure it out. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's it's uh, I'm sure my listeners are like my head's exploding right now uh, trying to just even think about these different options and, and the numbers involved and the calculations involved. So. Uh, definitely you want to seek a professional. Uh, Boris is there for you for that. Uh, all right, so let me ask you another question. I, I know that there is something that uh, was introduced in 2018 with the QBI deduction yeah. for pass-through entities. And how does that play out? I know that attorneys are in a special category along with accountants where there's some sort of cliff where you lose the QBI. Can you talk to our listeners about that? And is that something that they should focus on in their tax strategy in some way? 
Yes, absolutely. So what is QBI? QBI stands for Qualified Business Income Deduction. So let's just give the listeners a little bit of a background. Uh, when the new tax law, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or refer to this TICJA, it was one of the conferences and they referred to it as TICJA. So there you go. So when the TICJA was passed, right, the corporate tax rate across all the corporations in America became 21%, right? So that, ref- that applies to any corporation that is a C corporation. So what happens to the pass-through entities, such as single member LLC, sole proprietors, S corporations? The government came out and said, all right, you can get what's called a 20% deduction, a haircut from your income. So we'll just keep everything equal. If you made $100,000, that's your business income and your taxable income, for example, uh, 20% of that is $20,000. You can take that $20,000 and instead of paying tax on $100,000, you'll pay tax on $80,000. So that's what the 20% QBI is, right? So now then the government comes out and says, hey, by the way, if you are a specified service trader business, such as an accountant, uh, a doctor or an attorney and some other consultants and some other people in the group in the mix, if you make over a certain threshold, now don't quote me exactly on these numbers, but 2018 numbers for single individual, $207,000 with phase outs and married, uh, married couple, $415,000, including phase outs. If you make over this amount of money, if you're an attorney, you don't get the 20% deduction. So you would think, oh, well, so where, how do I start planning for this? Yeah, I don't get this deduction. So planning right, becomes- And I a- think, and, and just to, to interrupt you for a second, that's based off of your total income on your tax return, right? It's not just your business income. That's uh, based the, on your taxable income, correct. Right, so if your spouse is working in a $200,000 job and then you're bringing home you know, 200 or 300,000 uh, in income, you're in trouble. Yeah, so so you, you do be, you do get in trouble, and then when you and that's where you have to take a look at it and say, all right, what do I do now, right? How do I increase my income? Because some attorneys, they are in a better situation than the other ones because your taxable income could be somewhere around four hundred thousand dollars, four hundred fifty thousand, four hundred thirty thousand, just above the threshold. So what can you do during the year? Again, I'm going to emphasize during the year proactively and not after the year is over to be able to find extra deductions for yourself to reduce down the tax income, right? One of the attorneys we work with, uh, she's, uh, she's a single mom. Uh, you know, she's got a great business going on and because she's a single mom, her income, she actually falls into the category of 200 and something thousand dollars on the threshold. So right, right now we gave, we gave her a, a proposal, uh, an estimate, Hey, if you put away $30,000 into your profit sharing account, you'll save this much amount of money on taxes, but at the same time, you, 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 you'll free up QBI deductions for yourself. And I think in her case, it was like additional $8,000 deduction. Eight, mm-hmm. Additional $8,000 deduction at 30% bracket, that's $2,400 in your pocket, right? So QBI planning is extremely important, especially because whether you are around the threshold or not, or you are a single individual filing on Schedule C, I'll explain to you why. Just to make it simple for our listeners, let, let me put it to you this way. Everybody who's listening to this podcast right now is most likely an attorney, right? And almost every attorney that I've worked with, uh, when they start their firm, most of them open up an S corporation right away for themselves because they say, I heard I can save money on FICA taxes, right? Now, here's the thing. When you have a QBI deduction, opening an S corporation and having a W-2 salary could actually hurt your QBI deduction and the amount of QBI you can get that is given free to you by the IRS. So when you have a firm and you're about to become an S corporation or file for it again, you've got to talk to your prof- tax professional and be like, hey, can you quickly calculate and run numbers for me? These are my estimates, right? Will I lose my QBI if I have an S corp and I have a salary? Because the salary from the business reduces down your uh, business income. And it's a lower off the business income or the taxable income. So right. I, I know it's a lot, of, a lot of gibberish language for our listeners, but the point is just w- what to take away from this is that yes, QBI is uh, something that you need to consider, especially when it comes to entity selection. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. And up until your reasonable compensation is reached, you're paying self-employment tax, whether it's on the S-Corp side or on the pastor entity personal side, right? So um, it a pretty good rule of thumb is until you reach the income level of the reasonable compensation that you should pay yourself, you should remain a pass-through entity and not become an S-corp, right? I would agree. I would agree with that or, statement. Yes. 
for the QBI deduction. Obviously, there's all kinds of other effects that happen as far as how different expenses are taken, right. um, you know, that are that are coming to the mix, and everybody's situation is different. So definitely don't don't listen to this podcast and make your decisions off of it. But the point is, is that it's not a simple it's not a simple decision. Like you have to you have to actually crunch the numbers for your personal situation and figure out what's the right way to go. All right. So um, I think we talked about QBI. We didn't we didn't really talk about what specific strategies would help you with QBI. I guess we sh that that should be something that, that people deal with individually. I think globally, my understanding is, is that there's two ways to address that. You can try to decrease the business income or you could try to decrease the uh, the personal income, uh, you know, on your tax return. So there are some ways to do that with maybe making charitable donations or or maximizing your spouse's 401k and and reti the retirement options in addition to maximizing your retirement options and things like that. Anything you want to add to to that piece of it, Boris? Yeah. So maximizing your uh, spouse's retirement is definitely a good idea because it's still money in your own pocket. You just take it from one uh, pocket and putting it into another, which is just a, you know, a, a retirement deferred. In terms of uh, charitable contributions, only if you're a giver and you would give anyways, right? If you're not a giver and you want to give anyways, you know, no judgment made here, but a uh, charitable contribution doesn't reduce your taxes dollar for dollar and might not have that, that much big of effect on your QBI. So, right. but again, it could, right? It, it, it definitely depends on the amount of the contributions, but again, you gotta contact your professional to do this, uh, to do this calculation or just, you know, have a set tax plan for the year. So that's just being implemented. You don't have to worry about it once you've done all the calculations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so we have a few more minutes. You want to throw in another strategy that people might be uh, might be using when they, when they come in contact with you, uh, something that, they might not have been thinking about uh, otherwise? So um, I'm not going to throw in any more strategies into the mix because I want to use the couple of minutes that we have left to talk about what's going on with the COVID-19 crisis and the financial crisis and the effect it has on the, on the businesses across the country and the law firms and my business, right? And what we are doing to pivot our business and helping other businesses uh, to keep their doors open. Because Absolutely. I think this, this is something that's extremely important and we have gone from like a tax, I know we're doing this podcast for like tax, tax consulting and tax planning, but for the next few months, you know, it's not going to be tax planning as much as it's going to be COVID-19 consulting mm -hmm. that we are pivoting our business to because businesses need funding. And um, for anybody that's listening to this podcast, you must be aware of the fact that government is going to be infusing our economy with billions, if not trillion, right? I mean, the numbers is going up and up and up every time we hear the news with billions of dollars into the economy for the small businesses. Uh, make sure you stay on top of it. Call your professional if you need to, uh, but make sure you stay on top of it. Uh, one of the things is that government is giving out SBA loans for small businesses that were affected. Not much you have to do in terms of meet the requirements to apply, right? These are long-term loans over almost 30 years at 3.75%, up to $2 million per business. The loans are meant for you to help you with your fixed debt. The loans are meant for you to keep your employees, to pay your employees. There are tax credits that government is rolling out right now, such as payroll tax credits for any employee that was, you know, is being quarantined at home or is caring for the loved one who is being quarantined or any employee that has to stay at home because their kids are home from school and you have no choice but to give them off. But at the same time, you're not firing that employee, you're covering their payroll. They're, you know, uh, that's available to you up to a certain amount, right? So you want to make sure you look at all these things Right? Don't despair. The businesses are going to come back. Uh, be on the winning side. You know, look out for these things. There's help available. Uh, we are currently helping clients and business owners uh, across the country is with the funding process. With, you know, getting funding because that is what you need right now to keep your doors open. And uh, I'd be more than happy uh, if you agree, uh, Moshe. Is we can do another podcast completely dedicated to this. We can get into detail. I can use my whiteboard in the back just kind of give some few ideas. But really, I feel like businesses need this. Just up until last week, I, I myself was in denial. I was kind of on the sidelines, right? And then it just kind of hit me. And then uh, my mentor and a coach I was speaking to, he said, you know, what side of, uh, of history do I want to be on? Do I want to be on a winning side or losing side, right? So I want to be on a winning side. So right now, we've pivoted the business to completely help businesses stay, keep their doors open. 
not what's helping them save money on taxes because there is no tax payments if there's no money, right? right. It's still helping them keep the doors open. So uh, SBA funding is available. You guys can always reach out to either Moshe and Moshe can share our contact information or you guys can look it up. Uh, but definitely something, be the first ones in line to get it. Uh, help your businesses, you know, stay open, uh, stay safe and stay determined. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, are you helping people with that application process for the SBA loans or, or is there other sources of, of money that you have access to that you could, that you're helping coordinate? Uh, where, where are you in this, in this picture? Uh, yes, we are helping business owners apply for their SBA loans. So we do the pro application from A to Z and submit it. And then we work with the underwriter to make sure everything else is submitted, whether it comes to, whether it comes to, uh, financial statements. One of the SBA requirements is to have a personal net worth statement. So we're mm -hmm. putting that together as we speak right now, as you and I speak, you know, all of that is kind of in the process in my firm right now, putting that together for the clients, making that process as easy as possible because SBA wants to see how much assets you have, how much loans you have on the books personally and by the business and kind of putting all that together and submitting it to the SBA because these loans are given away by the government over 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. And there's even talks to turn some of those loans that you receive into grants to cover your payroll, to cover your rent and so forth. I don't know if it's gonna pass the house or the, uh, in the Congress at all, but you know, they have, do they have those talks, but the loans are available and the credits for you taking care of your employees are already available. So you gotta make sure you speak to your accountant, you speak to your payroll company. And one tip I will give to everybody here on the call is that if you already have employees who are taking sick leave, either for themselves, because if your employees is, uh, quarantine due to COVID-19, sick with it, or was told to stay home, the credit is up to the lower of the salary, daily salary, up to $500, $511 per day, up to 10 days uh, for the employee, for you paying them. Or if they're taking care of somebody uh, that they love who is being quarantined for the COVID-19, that's up to $200 a day. Or if your employee has to stay home because they have no choice, they have to watch their kids that are off from school, and you want to keep them on payroll, and you want to pay them, there's a credit for that as well. So with your payroll company, just make sure you keep track of any employee that you paid for sick days and for paid family leave. Because when the time comes to file your payroll taxes, this credit will be available as part of your payroll taxes, right? It may not exceed your payroll liability. Whatever payroll taxes you owe at the end of the quarter, you will use that credit and get that money back from the IRS. So super, super important for you to start keeping track of that. Now, is this only if the employee is not working? I mean, what a lot of our uh, uh, our listeners are either running virtual practices or they've quickly set up so that their employees can work from home. Um, now, there's it, it's hard to demonstrate that there's you know less productivity. You know, the employee yeah, is working from good. home, but they're but they're you know they're still they've got their kids there. They're probably a little bit less productive than they normally would be. Um, you know, how do you, how do you how do you quantify that? Is there do you do you know what they're doing to check that and what makes you you know eligible or not eligible? I actually have a few questions, so I'm going to throw them all at you at once. That's one. The second is is what if you're a, what if you're a solo and you don't have employees? So forget the employee uh, benefits, but that SBA loan, is that something that even a solo would be eligible for? Are they looking for a downturn in, in income? Do you have to show a drop off in revenue or can you just apply because it's available because you're in a disaster area? Uh, all right, stop right finally... here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I just want to remember all your questions. So we'll come back to your next question. I just want to cover okay. what I remember. So as far as the employees, yes, I, I myself set up remote. I'm in my office because I live very close to my office but my entire staff is like, my office is empty, right? Uh, everybody's working from home. The productivity, productivity level is not the same, but they're not off. They're still working for you. You can't get a credit. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of business owners there, a lot of attorney owners. They could have, you know, their employees might have been sick with the COVID-19, God forbid, or have been diagnosed or had to stay quarantined and not actually work. So in that case, uh, they, you, you can get applied for a credit. But as far as I know, there is nothing that I've seen that, you know, if you if you have employees working from home and they're not in the office, that you can still they get the credit because they are getting the work done. Will that change? Maybe I don't know. A lot of things are changing by the hour, but what we know for certain right now, if you were uh, giving your employees paid time off, uh, either sick leave or family leave, then you can get some kind of a credit for it from the government. And as far as the self-employed individuals, good news is that I read up on it recently as well. Um, it will be. By the way, if anybody wants to uh, be uh, Part of the email list that I sent out uh, 
uh, with these updates. I think you received one of our first emails with an update. We're going to be sending out more information about self-employed. They will be eligible to get that reduction in self-employment tax in that credit. Okay. There's more on coming to that. As far as the SBA loan, they are working on that. I believe I've heard it today, actually, and I read it today that the self-employed individuals will be eligible for it as well. Um, currently, they're not asking for anything that I've seen, at least the reduction in your sales, a reduction in revenue, uh, but it will happen, right? Uh, I have, I've spoken to a client today who's, who happens to be an attorney and who wants to do the SBA loan. He's like, Yo, my, 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 he's like no, my sales have not decreased. He said, but they will next month, right? He said, people stop coming through doors. So um, I don't think you have to show that as of yet, uh, or you can if they will ask for it, but as from the preliminary application that we have been doing and we've seen so far, they're not asking for that information yet. Right now, they just wanna know your net worth, your credit history, the business, you've been open for at least a year and so forth. Okay, and there's no need for you to have been profitable before, or you know, are they looking at that? Uh, so we haven't heard back from the underwriters yet because it's fairly new. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're just submitting applications. As the information becomes more available, underwriters will ask for that information. But when I got at the phone with the I, excuse me, SBA disaster relief folks, they said, hey, your business has been affected. You make sure you apply. That's it. No questions asked. Right. Uh, now I can tell that you're in New York City. <laughs> so you might, so for all, for all the listeners, keep in mind what I'm talking about right now is federal. Each state is coming out with their own relief, okay? I know, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on this, but the uh, state of Florida just released that they can help businesses fund a loan up to $100,000 interest-free. Uh, I know New York City for sure, the city itself, not the state, is giving up to $75,000 in interest-free loans and also up to $27,000 in grants to cover payroll. With this, you do have to show a loss in revenue. Uh, uh, for the past two months, right? I think they're comparing it to current two months and last year's two months. So every state has their own packages that they're rolling out. You can take advantage of that on top of the federal. Uh, so you want to make sure you stay, you check with your state and check, you know, listen to almost every state's governor is going live right now, uh, almost every day. So they always keep to have those updates over there. And that's where we're getting our updates and I know uh, putting it into our resources, but you be responsible for your own state. Yeah. Do you serve uh, cust uh, law firms across the country? Are you going to start staying on top of all 50 states as far as the, you know, what's what's happening with the uh, uh, with the with the state specific information? Great question. So right now with tax planning and tax consulting services, we do serve uh, attorneys all over the country. We are currently have clients in 15 different states. I have my map right here with like highlighted every state we have a cl client in. As far as SBA, same process. We're going to be serving clients from all different states. The client that we just signed up to today happens to be in Texas. We are going to do our best to stay on top of every state, uh, but the federal loan is available to everybody. And then, of course, we'll take a look at the state and see if there's anything that state offers, if something that the client needs besides what, besides what they're getting from the federal. But right now, only a few states have rolled out a few of their programs. But uh, uh, as I can imagine, just, this is just going to be more and more happening and, you know, clients are going to come back themselves and say, hey, this is happening in my state. And uh, you can definitely apply for both for each state. And we should be, we will be staying on top of each state. Um, you know, I don't make promises. I can keep 100%. We will try our best uh, to be, you know, if we get a client in Texas, we'll take a look in Texas. But we're not going to uh, stay on, on top of the state if we don't have a client there. Let's just put it that way. Right. Got it. Um all right. And is there a benefit to somebody going through you to help with this process as opposed to just going it alone? Uh, I know that you can just go to the SBA website and start the application process there. You refer to underwriters. So can you just uh, color that in for us? Uh, what is the process? How does that work? And do we need to, to find a specific underwriter? Uh, is, there, is it going to happen faster if, if we have you do it for us? Yeah, so the underwriters are provided by the SBA administration after you complete and submit a flawless, what I like to call flawless application, right? So we help our clients to submit that application and we make the process as easy and flawless as possible. I'll spend the entire weekend building out the, the, the processes of you know the, what type of information the client needs to make it easy for them. And the clients that we've been signing up for this, I'm telling them, you know, you should not spend more than 30 or 40 minutes of your time on giving us the information that we're requesting because we just made it so easy for you. Um, and there's a lot of paperwork to deal with. 
and you know building a personal net worth statement hey can a client do it on themselves of course they can will they do it right i don't know can somebody file their own taxes on turbo tax of course they can will they do it right we don't know right, right. Can somebody represent themselves in court absolutely they can but will they do it right who knows right so um and you got to be one of the first people to get the funding you got to be you know i mean their website is down uh, i was talking to uh some uh um other people in this area, in this field, and we're talking about how we're going to be submitting applications either in AM, late AM or early AM because the website mm -hmm. is down. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's very hard to submit. So, but can, to answer your question, yes, you can do it yourself, but if you want a flawless and fast process and make sure that you provide everything that the SBA is requesting in terms of the financial information, you probably want to do it with somebody who's, uh, who has more experience in this. Right. So uh, what, what can somebody expect to pay for this service if they're not your client already and, and they want you to go ahead and do this for them? Are you charging a flat fee or, or how exactly does that work? So um, there are strict guidelines that the uh, SBA administration has put out on what you actually are allowed to charge for this and what you're not allowed to charge for this. Kind of like and... a bankruptcy attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, accountants are involved and because accountants, we can make a determination of what can we actually charge because what if you also need your uh, 2019 tax returns or 2018 tax returns filed? Somebody who needs an SBA loan doesn't necessarily have their tax returns or financial statements or anything of that sort. It really depends on the scope. Mm -hmm. But for the application alone, there are some guidelines set out by the SBA what somebody can and cannot charge. Cannot be on contingency based. Obviously, there's regulation, rules and regulations. There's an engagement letter that we sign and so forth. Everybody's circumstance is different. So, uh, yeah, but it is a flat fee just to get everything going. So what are you doing? You're doing consultation calls to determine what that fee is going to be? Correct. Okay. Um, all right. So, Boris, thank you so much. We're going to we're gonna wrap it up here. What I'd like to, to know is, is how can somebody um, follow up with you if they want to engage you in their tax strategy, if they want to engage you in the SBA loan process, if they just want to get on your email list, what's the, what's the best next step for our listeners to take uh, to continue their journey with you? Thank you so much for asking. So we have put together a site. It's not our website. Our website is borismtax.com, but we made something much easier for people to remember. Uh, it's, it's a taxdiscoverycall.com. That's taxdiscoverycall.com. There's nothing on that page except my calendar with available times that you can speak to me. As far as getting on my email list, uh, they can go to my website, Boris M. Tax, B O R I S M S M A R Y T A X dot com. Uh, sign up for the newsletter, and we'll add them to the email list. But if somebody wants to get a you know immediate answers on what they can save and how much they can save on taxes, what can they do in terms of the these uncertain times, getting you know keeping their doors open, just taxdiscoverycall dot com. It's a it's a link to my own calendar. I will we'll get on the phone. And we'll take it from there. So that's tax discoverycall.com. All right. Awesome. So folks, you heard that tax discovery call.com and Boris M tax.com uh, sign up for the newsletter there. Boris, I appreciate your time. And you told me that you're going to be doing a webinar coming up. Do you already have the information for that? Do you want to tell our listeners about it or is that still uh, something that is, is in the, the planning stage? So the only thing that's certain about that webinar is date and time. So that's 1 p.m. Tuesday next week on the 31st, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. The webinar is going to be about, uh, you know, nav navigating your business during these uncertain times, getting funding from the government, tax credits that are available. Uh, we've, I, I will literally, you know, block the time on the calendar for this webinar about an hour before my call with you for this podcast. So, um, I will send you a link. You can send it out to everyone that um, in your network. Uh, this webinar will be purely informative, uh, just, uh, just filled with information about, uh, we're also gonna talk about some tax strategies, believe it or not, because everybody's working from home. And uh, I had one, this, uh, somebody reach out to me, say, you know, he's doing marketing for a lot of attorneys. He said, Boris, attorneys wanna know if they can deduct home office because everybody's working from home. Right. And some attorneys are on the impression that you cannot deduct home office because you have a physical location. So we're going to talk about how to go around that, be able to, to take as many tax deductions as possible while you're working from home. Mm -hmm. And then what can you do to keep your doors open in your business, getting funding, using tax credits, keeping your employees happy, making sure they're not fired, using you know IRS credits and so forth. Right. And folks, we're doing uh, a daily live stream 
for the uh, supporting you in these, this COVID pandemic and, and the fallout of it. And every day is a different topic. On March 31st at 1 p.m., we're doing the topic of managing a cash crunch. And Boris is going to be one of the panelists on that topic. So certainly if you, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you want to come and join us on March 31st at 1 p.m. for managing a cash crunch. You can sign up to all of those live streams at profitwithlaw.com forward slash COVID, profitwithlaw.com forward slash COVID. So uh, Moshe, uh, just one thing. I think I booked my webinar at the same time that I am doing the the cash crunch and yours. Uh, we are scheduled at 1 p.m. Uh, next week, Tuesday. Oh, to is the that webinar. the same date? That's on the th you're doing it on the 31st, right? Folks, you heard it here live. We, we, <laughs> we created a conflict for ourselves. That's okay. okay. I, can, I can work around yours and I can see if, uh, if I can see if I can move mine because mine is only set on the calendar. So we haven't notified anyone yet. So um, I'll see if I can move it to, to um, Wednesday. I'll let you know. All right. So what we're going to do here is we will definitely let you know when Boris has a date and time for his webinar. I didn't pick up on that when he was saying the date earlier. I was pulling out my phone to look at what the date was for hours and didn't catch that. So I appreciate you doing that. And uh, I appreciate, Boris, that you, you coming on to that live stream. Uh, we are less flexible than you in changing that because everybody already has that on their calendar. So no um we're going to cover some of this stuff on in that conversation, and then uh, Boris is going to be holding his webinar, and we'll let you know uh, when that's going to be, how to sign up for that, uh, so that you could get even more detail than what we go into in the managing a cash crunch. So, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm going to let you go, Boris, and get back to the important things that you're doing and helping everybody with their cash uh, management and their uh, you know getting assistance in this time of need. Uh, also in back to, to tax season and tax prep. Uh, sounds like we definitely have things that we can come back and revisit and, uh, and invite you back to the show for, for another episode where we could talk about some of those things that we didn't get to cover today. And uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed the, the discussion. I think our listeners will as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into the Profit With Law podcast. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us as well as helping us reach more people with this valuable content. Please leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast directory. Join us again next time when we are back with even more strategies to profit with law.